Welcome to the Inside Silverstone podcast, a business-focused podcast covering all things tech, engineering and innovation. Hosted by me, Chris Broom, a huge tech, motorsport and gaming fan, and also the owner of Longhurst, a firm of lifestyle financial planners and independent financial advisors located in Silverstone, Northamptonshire. This is a series of unscripted and unpolished conversations with leading business owners, thought leaders and high-tech talent where we discuss their experiences within the Silverstone business and motorsport region. We will also be asking them to share their knowledge, insight and their thoughts on the future just for you. If you're looking to learn more about the Silverstone high growth region and commercially connect with like-minded peers, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome to Inside Silverstone. Welcome to the next edition of Inside Silverstone. My name is Chris Broom and I'm your host. Today, I am delighted to finally welcome to the show for a one-to-one interview, the world-famous Louise Goodman. Who, Thank you, you very who much. Live in a cave and don't know who she is. She's an award-winning TV presenter and journalist and dubbed the first woman of Formula One. Louise, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. World famous might be pushing it a bit, but hey, thank you for the compliment. Definitely in our world, no doubt about it. Louise, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm absolutely thrilled. It's the second time you've been on. Uh, you were um, uh, gratefully on uh, Women in Motorsport International Women's Day special, which uh, which was episode 53. Um, I'm going to touch on that in a bit. Um, but as is customary, we like to run through quick or if indeed it can be a quick career snapshot, um, so our wonderful dear listeners can understand the journey from the beginning to where you are at the moment. So um, is it okay if we sort of touch on that? Yeah, sure. Um, cool. I, I mean, my, my, my career history is, is a bit of a set of happy circumstance in the sense that I really had no clear idea what I wanted to be when I grew up when I was a kid. Well, I lie slightly. I wanted to be a doctor and then I started doing physics and chemistry at school and decided maybe that such, wasn't such a good idea. But in terms of, you know, what was going to be my career path, I didn't really have any set ideas. You know, there was nothing that particularly leapt out at me. So my, my father said to me, um, well, why don't you get some secretarial training? And I said, well, I don't know what I do, what I do, but I do know I don't want to be a secretary. Um, and, and he said, and, and, a, and a business colleague of his said as well, you know, it's always a useful skill to have. So I found the shortest secretarial training course that I could find, a bit of shorthand, a bit of typing. Um, and then got my first job actually was working as a secretary for a firm of, of architects up in, up in London. So worked for them for a while and, and I'd always enjoyed traveling um, and had traveled quite a lot, you know, my parents put me on a bus at the age of 14 and sent me off to Germany to stay with a pen pal. I don't think people would think about doing that now, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and they'd given me for my 21st birthday a round the world ticket. So I, I set off on, on my, my, my travels, basically. Um, and um, oh, I missed out a bit before I set off on my travels. I went to um, America to do yeah. my travelling. Um, and there I met the editor of a magazine, um, a powerboat and water skiing magazine. And, and she offered me a job when I got back to London. So I started out initially selling advertising, which I very quickly realised I was absolutely rubbish at. And it was a very small um, publication. Only four of us worked on the magazine, a, a small specialist publishing house based in, uh, in Victoria in London. So I moved on to the editorial side and loved that. It was like I'd found what I was meant to do. I loved the writing aspect of it. I'd always enjoyed writing. It was always my best, or English was always my best subject at school. So I worked for the magazine and I worked there for about three years and, and over the course of that time rose up to the position of, of editor which sounds probably grander than it was because it was a sort of, as I said, a small publication where everybody did a bit of, bit of everything. But it, it just ticked all the boxes for me. I love the creative side. I love the, the writing side of it. And I got to travel as well going, going away to events. So then I went off on, on, my, uh, on my world travels. Um, and just before I'd gone, I'd, I touched base with a guy called Tony Jardine, who um, was just setting up his own PR company. I was looking for a slightly easier job in the sense that you know I had a little bit more more time um, to to do extra evening work because I was saving up money for my travel so I went to work for Tony uh, as his assistant um, 
and for about three months before I set off on my travels uh, and that was really was my entree into the world of motorsport Tony had always been involved in that in that business um, so yeah that was that was my entree into motorsport off I went um, around the world actually met up with Tony in Australia so I worked with him I, I kind of leapt off the bat of a motorbike and you know took off my my hippie traveling gear and put on the most business-like clothes I could find um, and went into the Formula One paddock with him at, uh, at Adelaide and worked as, as his assistant there um, and then you know hopped back on the motorbike and carried on on my travels basically but Tony said to me then you know let me know when you when you come back and you can come back and work for me in fact he got in contact with me by my parents and said I need you back now and I said well no I'm supposed to be traveling for another six months so we agreed on three months came back and started started working for him again um yeah and it, it's kind of gone on from there and so first woman of f1 dubbed so i can't remember who dubbed me that but it's a good tagline isn't it, great I'm tagline. it. I, so, I basically i think i was the first woman from the uk who was visibly working in formula one um, and, th and that came about, you know, when I started working for ITV. Now, I, I'd already been working in Formula One for quite a few years then. That's how the ITV job, job came, uh, came about. And so, and so what had you done prior to ITV? So I've got, I've got right down here, Jordan, marketing. Yeah, well, PR, PR, basically PR. So via Tony, I was, became the press officer for um, a team, I'm dating myself here, but a team called Leighton House. Um, that were around in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And, uh, and that was really my, my entree into a full-time career in, in Formula One. Um, we had a client, uh, BP, um, and who was sponsoring the Leighton House team, and therefore they funded me as the press officer. So I travelled with the team to all of the races, still based with, with Tony uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but was yeah. working for the, for the team at, at the races. I also helped out Tony, um, one of our large clients at Johnny PR was, was RJ Reynolds, which was Camel Cigarettes, back in the days when um, you know, cigarette sponsorship was quite prevalent in, in Formula One and motorsport in general. So, um, so I worked with Tony with some of the Camel ancillary sponsorships as, as well. And then through Camel actually, because at the time Eddie Jordan, was racing in the junior formerly so he was in in british formula three um and in the you know the the, the series leading up to effectively what is now formula two oh. um, two as was then and um so i i became um briefly via camel eddie's uh press officer for sorry it's f3000 was that was the championship then onto Leighton House and then Eddie approached me and said listen I'm, I'm looking for a, a full-time press officer so this was back in the early days at Jordan uh, it was 92 so it was year two for the Formula One team so that's when I, I went to to work for Eddie so had um, five uh, great fun um, highly eventful it's never a dull moment around Eddie Jordan uh, effectively as their I say their press officer I was the media department you know it was it was just me Teams were a lot smaller then. I think I was employee number 49 when I first joined. That was the entire factory wow. race team, everything. Whereas now, you know, it takes more people than that to, to put up the Red Bull hospitality unit. Yeah, so yeah. It, was, uh, it was a very different scenario then. So, so yeah, I, 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 I did all the media communications, but I did a lot of work with the sponsors as well. You know, when they came along to events, I'd be doing the garage tours. And I, I was sort of media communications, marketing, PR, you know, I had quite everything, a lot of hands on. Everything. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and what was it like as an early female adopter in Formula One? So presumably there weren't too many other ladies in the paddock, in you know, working with the team. No, there weren't. And suddenly enough, you know, when um, Tony had sent me into the Formula One paddock to, to work for Leighton House, the guy who was at the time running Leighton House was, was a guy called Ian Phillips. Um, who, when Tony said, I've got this girl who's going to come along as your press officer, Ian said, no, nah, no, nah, not having a girl on the team. It's just going to be a distraction. We don't want to go on the team, blah, blah, blah. And Tony said, no, she's quite good. She's, you know, she'll be all right. And um, cut forward to my Jordan days. And Ian, in fact, had then had moved from Leighton House to Jordan. So he was the sort of head of sponsorship at, at, at Jordan. So, and, and he'd seen by that point that I could, you know, just get stuck in. And I think you did have to be, 
to a certain extent one of the lads back then you had to have fairly thick skin and and uh, but to be fair having said that I you know I think right from the outset I was quite clear about the fact I'm here to work and I'm not taking any you guess what that word here anybody, anybody, I'm not yeah. taking any shit from anybody <laughs> so don't even try it um Good. And, and I think once they knew that I was going to give as good as I could get, I, I could have a laugh as much yeah. as anybody, but also that, that, you know, I was there to do a job and I was going to do a damn good job and nobody was going to get in my way. I didn't get any, any grief from my grid. I think it helps being five foot ten and bossy. I've, I've always worked on that basis. I think if I was a demure, you know, five foot two, slightly shy thing, it, it, it may have been a different story. But so I, I can only speak from personal experience. No, there weren't that many women around in the paddock then. I mean, on the teams generally, it might be a press officer. And very often the people who ran the, the motorhomes would be a couple. So it would be a, you know, a husband and wife or a bloke and a woman uh, running, running the motorhomes. And, and for many years, you know, it was just the two of us, the two girls at the Grand Prix and probably only about four or five girls back at the factory as well. So there weren't that, that many girls around. We did have to do things like, you know, we were sponsored by Unipart and, and back in those non-PC days, Unipart used to put together the, the Unipart calendar, um, which, you know, featured scantily clad women under the guise of being shot. I can't remember if it was Litchfield, but some famous photographer. So that, that made it arty. So, uh, and, and I, you know, I would sort of say, I'm not really sure. And the boys would have them all down in the race shop. So mm. myself and the other girls, we thought, right. So we bought a calendar of, I can't remember what they were called, but one of those, you know, bunch of lads who took their gear off. And sure. um, what were they called? Uh, God, God knows, firemen, whatever they were. No, they weren't firemen. There was, a, there was a group of blokes who used to go around to clubs and I can't remember what they were called, dream boys or something like that. Yeah, anyway, yeah. We, bought, we bought their calendar. Chippendales, the Chippendales. Chippendales, that's the one. See, you did know after. <laughs> and we, we start pictures of the Chippendales all around over the top of the Unipart ones. And of course, when all the boys came, we're like, what's that? It's like, yeah, you don't like it. We don't like it. So let's just Very agree good. a truce here, shall we? And, 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 and just so my listeners know, I did not have a Chippendales calendar <laughs> up in my, in my <laughs> when I was growing up. That's what you wanted to be when you grew up. <laughs> So, uh, media relations for drivers. So, yes. I, read on, I read on your bio that, uh, and we've spoken about it before, that you, you looked after drivers. So, yes. in real simple terms, for the, certainly for those that, that are maybe even considering this as a career path, what does that actually consist of? Uh, it's slightly different nowadays because also it's, it's a far more complex media environment that people are dealing with. But in essence, what I was doing back then was obviously the, the drivers of the team were the, were the public face of the team. So the, the drivers and, and Eddie Jordan were the ones that people wanted to interview. My job was to be the interface between the, the drivers and EJ and, and the media. So part of it was sending stories out, part of it was being creative, coming up with stories that would generate exposure for the team. Uh -huh. we, we used to, we were a small team, we weren't going to be winning races. So we used to work on the basis that we had to give value for money in terms of PR and media content before we ever got to a racetrack. So that meant that I could be quite creative. And I was blessed with having somebody like Eddie Jordan, who in who I referred to earlier on and myself, we used to joke with each other, like, does he want to be rich today or does he want to be famous today? You know, they, those were two Eddie's favorite things. So it meant was, was Ian going to have a busy day or was I going to have a busy day? So Eddie was very open to all sorts of daft ideas that I, that I came up, all things that came to me. I, I can remember um, I had a phone call one day from somebody who said, uh, we want to get married at a Grand Prix. And this was before you could actually get, get married, you know, away from a church. But, but we agreed that they would come into the pit lane at the British Grand Prix in their full bridal gear and have pictures taken with them. My instant thought was, that's a brilliant picture for the sun and the tabloids they will love that mm. the team that it had come from had thought oh no that's not really our you know and fair enough it wasn't it wasn't their you know their their, their style but we were known as the fun team the, the party team to a certain extent um so ej was very open to to me being you know coming up with different ideas and very happy to put himself in the media spotlight you know he, he loved that and always enjoyed it so it meant i had carte blanche to to do what I wanted. And the same applied to the drivers. I mean, obviously it's, it's a bit more um, restricted, it's not the right word, but it's a different, I could promote Eddie as the, the fun party animal leader of the team. The drivers, we, we had to sort of promote them in a slightly different way. Mm. Um, but it was a matter of, you know, 
promoting them and interfacing between them and the media, but also liaising between them and the sponsors. So when sponsors wanted the drivers for an appearance, I was the one who had to cajole and persuade the drivers that, yeah, do you know what? You're going to really enjoy standing in a petrol station forecourt filling up people's cars. You're going to love it. It's going to be, it's going to be brilliant. You know? So, um, brilliant. And, and again, I think, um, you know, I think personally that sometimes that's a role that, that women lend themselves to because I had no problem or turn it around the other way. I think the drivers found it a little more tricky then to tell me to get lost. Uh, yeah. um, and I and I would quite happily say, oh, go on, do us a favour. You know, I would cajole them in a different way that, that possibly, you know, men and women aren't the same. We have a lot of similar skill sets and not all men and not all women are the same. But I think yeah. that is one of the differences where, you know, those differences can work together. I could persuade them cajole them to do things that a bloke either would have been comfortable cajoling them or wouldn't have got the wouldn't have got the same response especially as you know drivers like all of us will have different public uh, personalities and private personalities so yeah. you know, by all accounts kimmy well you can see what kimmy's like on tv but privately he's a bit of a party boy so it's like okay so imagine trying to get him to do one of these things that you're saying I, thankfully, I never had. I never had to do that. I never had to. Do right. that. So, but so some of the people that you have, you, you did do that for people like Alonso. Um, no, not Alonso. I worked with people like if I run through the roster of you know the drivers at Jordan, we have people like Eddie Irvine, um, Rubens Barrichello, Martin Brundle. Now, there's three very different characters. You know, Eddie Irvine created a, an absolute media storm when he made his debut with us at, at the Japanese Grand Prix. Um, by effectively not getting in a punch up, but Ayrton Senna took a swing at him. So, so that story was was out there straight away. So, uh, and Eddie, Eddie was a very interesting character because the public face of Eddie Irvine and the private face of Eddie Irvine were quite different. You know, he, he's a he's a frightening, intelligent, smart man um, uh, who does a very good job of making out like a fool sometimes so so he was all and actually he was great to work with because he always listened to me Rubens Barrichello they were racing against each other at the time you know Rubens had been fated from a young age and he wasn't used to people telling him no you that's not happening mate you're doing it this way so at times you know I I had to work them both in 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 different ways um whereas Martin Brundle the the, the, the driver I worked with in my final year as a press officer Oh, it was like breathing inside so relief. He turned up on time, wearing the right clothes. His shirt was ironed. He said all the right things to all the right people. It's like, oh, well, finally, I'm working with a grown-up. Yeah, it was great. Murray Walker. I've literally yeah. got my pad here, all my notes. I've got Murray Walker, discuss, exclamation mark. Oh, Murray lovely. Walker. Talk to us about Murray Walker, because... Well, I obviously first came across Murray when I was working as a, as a, as a press officer. Um, you know, back in those days, I was... was feeding faxes through to people. I can remember the, the glory days when you could have an automated fax list. And um, so I'd send my, my fax, my press release off to this lovely lady who then faxed it out to all of her contacts. And Murray always requested, could he have his in, in written format, please? So I had to fold it up and put it in an envelope and, and send it off to Murray. And when I moved from, from Leighton House to Jordan, I've still got it somewhere here in my office. Murray sent me, a typical Murray, a little handwritten note saying so pleased to hear about your, your new job dear and I really hope it goes really well and, and um, you know you'll be great at it and they didn't need to do that you know I was absolutely gobsmacked when I when I got it little did I know that obviously subsequently I would I would end up working with him and he was just I mean he is a broadcasting legend you know so to and just to be in he's also a, a captivating fascinating person um, that's why he's such a good broadcaster. So just to spend time with him, and some of the, my best memories are when we would be, you know, driving to, to the races. So um, and back in the day, it would be um, James Allen would drive, I'd be in the passenger seat, and Murray would be sat in the, in the back of the car, regaling us with stories from his days in the advertising industry and his war years and all these different things. I remember driving to one of the events in uh, in Germany and we were passing over a bridge and Murray was chatting away in the background and James and obviously I weren't paying enough attention and Murray suddenly said, Oi, listen to this story. I almost died crossing this bridge back in the war so that you could be his man. But he was just such a such a sweetheart. A, a man of his time. I mean, I, I do remember at the British Grand Prix one year, there was a big spread in 
Mail on Sunday, I think it was, um, you know, a piece with Murray and, and Murray holding forth about motorsport Formula One. It wasn't really a place for a woman. Um, you know, it was, it was really a man's world. And so I, uh, I, I went with the newspaper and said, oh, Murray, um, see this? You said here that it's not a place for a woman? Yes, dear. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's really in my... I said, Murray, can I just point out, I'm a woman? He said, oh, I didn't mean you, dear. No, you absolutely belong here. You know, this is, um, Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, he's Generational an absolute... thing, though, isn't it? I mean, people... Absolutely. Murray Walker must be, what, mid-90s now? I mean, you, yeah. know, you know, to have fought in the Second World War. I don't think people realise, actually, that that happened. No, no, you know, the history that Murray has, the stories yeah. that he can tell, you know, and, and the memory that, you know, he can take you back to any motor race that's ever held. He can talk you, you know, the stories he would tell about, you know, Formula One of the 50s and 60s and the other kinds of motorsport that he, he worked on. Um, just amazing. Yeah, no, agreed. What's your favourite circuit? <sighs> Do you know, it's a really tricky one. I think it's all that it's the ones that begin with M. But but you know, I theoretically here I, I should say Spa because it's you know. But, but I tend to um, it's the memories that you make at a circuit. So so Melbourne, I love Australia. I've got lots of mates down there, so I love it when we go to Melbourne. You know, Monza. I've always had a lot of fun in Monza. Montreal was always a Canada was always a a party race back in the day, and of course the ultimate party race Monaco, um, which back in the early days was an absolute nightmare to work out in terms of the facilities. You know, the, the, the press office was probably located about half a mile, if not more, through behind grandstands and upstairs and downstairs. And then you get into a lift and go up into a dark multi-story car park. And this is pre elonic you know, electronic anything days. So you get up there with your, with your thick wad of press releases that you, you printed off. And somebody says, oh, have you got a copy of yesterday's release? And you think, Give me an hour, you know, you'd have to do the reverse journey and go back and, um, but, but all, you know, somewhere like that, the, the atmosphere of it. Sure. And obviously Silverstone as well. And obviously, well, listen, no, Silverstone was, was always going to be there. No, do you know what? And genuinely, what I love about Silverstone, and I've been very lucky to have been around on the flatbed truck when the driver's parade is, is going around filming on that. And honestly, my heart swelled with pride because I've been, I've had that experience at quite a few of the Grand Prix. I've been in a very, very enviable position that I've been able to do that. And the thing about Silverstone is the warmth of the crowd there for all of the drivers. Yes, they love the British drivers, but the, the, the reception that they give to all of the drivers, there, there is a proper love of motorsport and a proper passion for motorsport. And there is always going to be, you know, a, a pride in your home event. Mm -hmm. And it is for the majority of the Formula One teams, it is their home event. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely sense that. We had used to have the best party back in the Jordan days. But, but I say we invented the post-race Silverstone concert. We used to dial in a flatbed truck because Eddie Jordan, one of his other great loves is music. So, and he's, yeah. a, he's a bit of a drummer. So we would dial in a flatbed truck and he would have a few of his like muso mates on, you know, we'd have Nick Mason up there on drums with EJ on an, on an identical set and, and various Damon would come in and play a bit, of, a bit of guitar and Johnny Herbert would jump up and sing, go Johnny go. And, and, you know, eventually it got to the point where so many fans had found out about it. were trying to break into the paddock. It had to move outside the paddock and, and it sort of morphed into what is now the, uh, you know, the, the fantastic... Yeah, 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 yeah. You made it a thing. Great. I, I, can, I mean, I live uh, just obviously outside Silverstone and our office is based there and I can vouch that the energy, you know, two weeks ahead of time, a month ahead of time really, but two weeks and then certainly the week, you know, up to the race, it's just absolutely buzzing, absolutely buzzing. And, and, and because so many of the teams are here, so because a lot of the uh, the manufacturers and the, the people that are designing, you know, all the composite bits and what have you, are all based on Silverstone Park. The... Uh, it's absolutely buzzing. So uh, I love the. I know what you mean because I obviously in my Jordan days, but also nowadays, um, I with my my media training, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. I'll I'll run quite a lot of my sessions um, in at Izone um, Performance up at, up at Silverstone. So I'm I'm up and down there quite a lot. And yeah, that build up is fantastic. And mm. and you know when you see the signs going up for the campsites, that's another thing I think is brilliant about the British Grand Prix. Some of the races are. Um, you know, it's it's something that happening that's happening during the day, and then 
you know that that's it there's there's no atmosphere there's no but you see people start to move in you know a week in advance so that they can get this is where we always camp we've been doing it for 25 years we're going to meet up with these people when we get there and you know it right. is that that whole area just becomes like a festival it's like i can yeah. just sit in my garden i do and i can just listen to it it's fantastic yeah. everyone having yeah. a good time um favorite race series so you've been a obviously a reporter journalist involved in f1 british touring car le mans you've even presented at the goodwood festival of speed do you have a favorite series i have to say i do love the british touring car championship which is the, my main focus from a from a tv perspective now i'm part of the, the team that puts together the programs for for itv4 the live shows and i just love that championship it's sort of i'm going to sound like an old has been here but it reminds me about what formula one was like back in the day i think formula one obviously it's, it's grown and the media landscape has grown as well so it's it's not the same as it used to be nor should it be everything everything moves on but I think it's lost some of the the intimacy is not the right word, but do you know what I mean? That that cohesiveness, mm -hmm. that closeness that there that there was back in the day. And that's what touring cars has. So as a journalist, you know, with ITV, I'm a much bigger fish in a much smaller pond in the British Touring Car Championship. So that also means that, you know, sort of when I say jump, the drivers say how high. They the access that they give us, there's much more cohesion of working together between the teams, the drivers and mm. the and the media because we know we, we need each other and we work well together. And I think particularly the TV, you know, we we help in in some ways with with the lifeblood of the championship, that exposure that we give. Mm. You know, having national um free to air viewing um of the championship is is absolutely brilliant for them. So um and it's just a but the, the, the best thing about it is the racing. Yeah, no, the racing throughout the championship. Yeah. I mean, it's I am regularly, so it's not just touring cars. You've got everything from the Janetta G. You've got 14 year olds with race craft like you can't believe. Um, you know, you've got the Janetta Super Cup. You've got, you've got the minis coming into the championship this year for the first time. You've got F4. So you've got the stars of the future. You know, I was interviewing Lando Norris a few years ago. I should point down when I talk about interviewing Lando Norris. And like, you know, that's the championship where stars of the future come through. Lando obviously now racing for, for uh, McLaren in, in Formula One. So, and then at the top level, you, you've got the touring cars. And I am regularly, we have a little sort of backstage presentation area. So I'll be there with Steve Ryder and some of the technicians and we'll have a monitor with the, the pictures on and a monitor with the timing on. And I'm regularly jumping up down and shouting at the television. You know, it's just... It's exciting. If you like racing, yes, Formula One's brilliant. It's all about the strategy. And it, but, you know, sometimes you just want to see them getting stuck in. Don't you? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what you get all the time in the BTCC. Sometimes you get a little bit too stuck in. But at times that, you know, there, there have been some races where I remember the, the season, the last race of the season a couple of years ago, you know, we had two, two drivers, Josh Cook and Ash Sutton, who lap after lap after lap were wheel to wheel and the, the you know it was spectacular to watch it was it was like ballet watching them race because they were so respectful of each other the the race craft was absolutely fantastic it was breathtaking it, it really was and i think that's something that you don't see so often in formula one these days no, it's no, that no. that side to side you know yeah and you, you've been involved in the championship yourself so many people might not know this so you have raced competitively and done okay and done pretty well so yeah it's, well I've, I've done more rallying than i have racing so oh, it's a form, form of racing right well it, it's a it's a form of motorsport so um uh, tony jardine who i mentioned earlier has has always rallied and i kept saying to him i'll go and get some so take me out. I'll, I'll be a navigator. Take me out. Anyway, he called me into his office one day and said, what are you doing at the weekend? And I said, well, nothing particularly wise. I said, right, you're navigating for me on the wide-end stages. My regular co-driver can't make it. So I had a crash course in, in navigation. Um, and I said to Tony, I, I might leave you blind for the first couple of stages just while I get my eye in. But, you know, we set off and half a stage. And I'm like, I told you, don't cut. You know, one, blah, blah, blah. absolutely loved it. Cut forward to when I started working in television. I was approached by... and. You know, then I had a sort of a more of a, or had a profile, not more of a profile. I had a profile which I hadn't really had previously. And I was approached by Ford, who were at the time running a Ford car championship, which was a sort of entry level for rallying. So I, I started doing that with, with coaching from the wonderful Bill Gwynn Rally School um, up at Terwestern, so close to Silverstone. 
um, and uh, and yeah, did did a couple of years of, of competition in in sort of one of the the national rally championships, culminating in doing um, Wales Rally GB, which is obviously it's like competing on the bill at the British Grand Prix. You know, you you're on the same um, same stages at effectively at the same time as the the top drivers in the world and i think the skill of rally drivers i i would actually put rally drivers right up there when it comes to which are the most uh, skillful uh, drivers in the world um it's a different art seeing all the different kinds of you know ground that you're coming across and thinking so far ahead and uh, uh so so yeah that was that was brilliant i in fact somewhere back here i've got my uh, got my little trophy for finishing third in class um on wales rally gb which was i was i was emotionally and physically exhausted at the end of it but what an amazing experience there was one one evening um that one of the stages i was obviously running quite a lot further down the field than, than the top guys you know you'll start off with 100 and, 130, 140 people at the start of the rally. Um, and one of the stages, there'd been an incident. So effectively, they, they cut it off and said, right, you guys, you're not going to get to do the rest of the stages. It's, we're not going to have time. So I was, we were driving home on the road, as it were, going, going back to base. But we were at the end of this lot. And coming up not long behind us, we had the top bar. So effectively, going through these country lanes, there were hundreds of people turned out to see all the top rally stuff. Mm. As we drove, drove <laughs> it was like, it was like being, it was like my version of being on that truck, you know, having yeah. Grand Prix with all the fans applauding. It's absolutely fantastic. But I loved it, absolutely loved it. And it did give me a little bit of insight, just a tiny bit of insight into actually that, you know, that, that driver's, that, driver's brain that driver's mind yeah that like mindset you've got to be focused yeah. on point, yeah. step up you know especially if you've got people lining the the, the the country roads and the streets you know yeah waving their flags um so obviously you're still involved with itv and british tour and car which is amazing but you also do media training right so yes so, what, what yeah, else so you, I, what, what's your side hustle my side hustle so my media training it, it kind of started out when i was working for itv doing the formula one I kind of knew this, this isn't going to go on forever. I'm going to need another string to my bow. And I kept, well, what can I do? What can I do? And then I was chatting with, um, with a couple of driver friends up at the autosport show. And one of them said to me, do you know anybody who does media training? And I thought, that's what I could do. Uh, you know, I've got all the, the, I've got a PR background. I've worked as a, you know, as a broadcaster, but I've also, over the course of the years, I've written, you know, for newspapers and magazines, I've done radio, I've, so I can see it from, from both sides, from the, you know, a team and, you know, promotion PR side, but also from, from the media side. So, so that's what I started doing and initially working with people just in the motorsport sector. I've now broadened it out because effectively the, 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 the lessons, the, the learning that you bring to people is the same, you know, uh, how to respond in a crisis interview when you've had a bad race is the, the, the learnings are the same as how a business would respond from a media perspective in, you know, in, in a crisis scenario. So, so, um, and, and I, yeah, I absolutely, absolutely love it. So that really keeps me, keeps me very busy now. So some clients will just want media training. Um, and, and I tend to work on a sort of, uh, a fairly bespoke basis so I know there are companies out there that will get 200 people together and talk to them about you know how the media work I think you learn best by being hands-on so I'll work with the camera crew we'll yeah. actually record interviews with you we'll play them back we'll look at them uh, but there's a whole broad range of topics that we that we look at so it's not just um, you know how to be interviewed it's also presentation skills what makes a good presentation your body language um, you know how to use your voice effectively how to engage an audience you know what makes a good story so and it depends on what the client wants and, and the areas that they might be working in as to the actual topics that we'll that we'll cover with them so but it's it's um, I, I never knew I had such a latent teacher inside me it's very gratifying it can be exhausting because it's you're giving out a lot of energy every day mm. but it's also you know you're, you're getting a lot back you know when you look at the the recordings of what people were like when they walked in at the beginning of the day and what they're like when they walk out at the end but also the way that they walk out the confidence mm -hmm. that it gives to people i think a lot of a lack of confidence in these scenarios comes from a lack of knowledge and understanding of the situation that you're actually in so once you know 
you understand the technicalities of what the press are trying to do and you're therefore able to work with them better then the ball starts rolling in the right direction you get the confidence when you know how to stand when you know how to uh -huh. where to look even with some people um you know i'm some of the young racing drivers i'm working with it's it, you know just getting them to look up would, would, would be a start because yeah, you know, yeah. um and obviously business people as well it's amazing how many business people who are quite used to standing up and making a, a presentation um but suddenly they've got to do it I, I was working with a client recently um who is you know is used to making business presentations in a room but she'd been asked to go to washington and make a presentation to thousands and thousands of people so so it's a, an understanding of well how do i adapt what i'm going to talk about and how i'm going to talk about it to make it relevant and applicable for, for this particular audience so um it's no two clients are the same and i love the challenge of putting together different programs for, for different people and as i say seeing the the progress that they make from from the start to the, to the end of the session and the confidence that they that they leave with and so presumably you can also do this um uh, now we're because this has been recorded during covid so presumably some of this training can be done virtually so if, if uh... well and that's something i'm working on at the moment because my as I was saying, I, you know, I work on the basis of recording things with people and then playing them back to them. So we'll sit down together, we'll analyze them, we'll say, well, how could you have done that differently? Well, so uh, as all businesses need to during these times, I'm, I'm sort of adapting. It won't be applicable for some of my more intense training sessions because I think you do need to be one to one for that. But I'm, I'm in the process of putting together some some um, you know, some some modules that I can do with people as an as an online course rather than a than a than a face to face even if that's just as a first step to then yeah, yeah. when we're when we're out of lockdown yeah, whenever yeah. that may be so yeah yeah, yeah. with the next one so that's good so for folk listening to this who are part of silverstone park and silverstone technology cluster you know louise is going to be available so i'll make sure her details and her, her website are included in the show notes as i always do and so obviously it doesn't have to be a motorsport related business it can be any type of business it could even be professional services like longhurst where i stand up and do presentations to my peers i actually employed the services of somebody probably 18 months ago to do the same thing for me and uh, because I, I kept i kept shuffling i'm, I'm a shuffle yeah. I, I was a shuffler and i was also a very shallow breather and so i i would run out of breath because i just get super anxious um which that's what everybody does when we get nervous yeah, do yeah. That. and i remember being the same when i was first given a microphone I, my voice went really <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah that's very good right louise we're 36 minutes in and it's supposed oh, to be sorry. an interview how great is that Dapper too much <laughs> no it's good it's good it's good to be honest most interviews overrun because we always end up gas bagging so right what have we covered off i've covered, i think i've covered off pretty much all of my agenda um good covid What's the one thing you're looking forward to the most once this nonsense is out of the way? Going to the pub, I think. Just just going down to the village pub and meeting up with my mates. We're just waving at each other from a distance now and doing Zoom. We have we have a girls uh, Zoom drinks on a on a Friday night, but it's not quite the same, is it? Uh, as sitting down in the pub with them. Do you know what though? But we've I've been starting to do uh, you know pub quizzes and uh, poker nights and also uh, with my old school friends getting together to do a pub night every sort of Friday or every other Friday and it's lovely actually because I'm seeing them more I'm talking to them more than, than I was prior you know normally you get together you know two or three times a year and it's fantastic but now it's literally becoming nearly weekly so <laughs> I think that's yeah yeah and I have to add in actually just on a soppy level I can't wait to give my mum a hug as well oh, you know yeah. She's down in Hampshire on her own. Okay, she's got family around who are able to look after her, but but uh, we've upskilled her so she can now use WhatsApp video chat. So that's been great. But it's yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's just missing that that contact with with family and friends, isn't it? I think everybody's going to going to be. Um, very relieved to, to get that back once this is all over yeah you know video conferencing zoom stuff like this is great but it doesn't doesn't replace human contact right and humanity yeah. and uh and just being around people you care about and love so right last two questions or actually yes. probably on to the last two questions is there anything i haven't asked you anything else whilst, whilst we, we, we've overrun it doesn't matter so what, what else anything else you want to oh, no not particularly off the top of my head nothing nothing particularly that springs to mind fine embarrassing story so just to explain for those that haven't listened to the podcast before we, we're now i don't know what episode this is 60 something um and it is the season finale but 
we love to share embarrassing stories um, because, look, we like, we like laughing at each other, right? And why not? And so there must be something in Louise Goodman's back catalogue of F1, British Touring Car, ITV, Eddie Jordan, whatever it is, is there a funny story you could share with us? Yeah, there is. There, there are a few I can't share, but, but the one I can share with you, that's really mean when people say that, isn't it? goes back to my, my early days of, of working for ITV in, in the Formula One in the, in the pit lane. Um, and I was terribly nervous. Um, and the drivers, because I'd been around the paddock for a while, they knew I was suddenly in a different situation. They were all great. They were really gentle with me. They were really kind. British Grand Prix um, in my first year, um, Johnny Herbert, um, who I'd always had a good, fun relationship, um, you know, ever since we'd, we'd known each other, uh, difficult not to have fun with Johnny. But Johnny said to me, you're getting a bit, get, getting a bit better, getting a bit, I said, oh, yeah, I'm getting a bit more relaxed about it now. And he said, uh, that huge mistake, he said, time to have some fun. So I'm waiting for them to throw down to me for a live interview with him on the grid at Silverstone. Um, and, uh, and suddenly, this hand comes out and starts like prodding at, at me and slapping it away and thought that was it. No, cut forward a, a couple of races and we were in, in Austria. And, and again, I was doing an interview with, uh, with, with Johnny and, um, and in true Johnny style, he, he, when he went to ask, he said, yeah, well, and this hand came out and grabbed my breast. And I know that sounds terribly shocking to people, but as I say, bear in mind, Johnny and I know each other a long time and, and get on very well. Um, and I, so I slapped him and we stopped. And he said, oh, was it not live? I thought it was live. I said, no, it wasn't live. So we're going to do it again. So anyway, we, we start again. Tell me about blah, 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 Johnny. Said, yeah, well, and sure enough, the hand came out and, and went for my breast again. I thought, right, I'm not having any of that. So I just left it. And then on my next question, I, I thought too complete that game. Yeah, too shy. That's the best. So we had a giggle about it, forgot about it. We get to the next race, and yeah, that's not the embarrassing bit. The embarrassing bit is we get to the next race, and an Austrian journalist came up to me and said, "So, oh, I, I love that film of you and Johnny." I said, well, "What do you mean?" She said, well, "You know, Johnny when he's grabbing your your breast." I said, "What do you mean? How do you know about?" She said, "It was on Austrian television." So, unbeknownst to both of us. It had not only been filmed, but broadcast oh by my God. television. Oh my and God. I think it's one thing to be mucking about with your mate when nobody knows, but that, for, for people out there in the wide world who don't know us, who don't know, that must have just looked appalling oh to see. God. Presumably that doesn't exist anymore. I'm not, not going to Google it, but <laughs> who knows? No. No, what you will get if you Google is my DC story, but I won't go. I'll let people Google that. When okay, I'm, fine. <laughs> I'm going to Google that. Since we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, very that last question. Very, very last question. So we have some fantastic students listening to the show who are part of either you know, Silverstone's technology for sort the of college uh, through to other local schools and uh, technology colleges within sort of South Northamptonshire. So we like to sort of pass on, if we can, some wisdom to them. And so my question to you would be, uh, take yourself back to, you know, just before you went off travelling, right? And so this was where you were very, very young, about to experience the world for the first time and then have this phenomenal career as we've just talked through. What one bit of advice would you give a younger Louise? I, I think uh, two things. I think the advice I would give myself is make sure that you make the memories and remember the memories. Take a camera with you because I, you know, there are so many things that happen. I was too busy doing it to, to, to sort of take any pictures of it. And I, I miss now being able to look back and I've got loads of pictures of me at the final Grand Prix of the year because I've never taken any of the rest of the season. So um, that would be a personal one. But I think in terms of what I think from my learnings, from what, um, what's worked for me is to just make sure you don't throw through life with blinkers on. I think keep your eyes open to, to any opportunities that, that, that may come along because you, know, you never know. I, back at the start of this chat, I referred to the, the fact that my, you know, my career has in many ways been a set of happy circumstances. And that's because I was, I was, I was open. I was, you know, had my eyes open to see what was, what was going on, on around me. Maybe that's, you know, if, if you want to be a doctor, there's a set route that you're going to go down. But I think if you... You know, if, if you're not in that situation, and I don't think people have careers for life in this day and age as, as they did sort of 30, 40 years ago, I think just 
you know, be open to opportunities and put yourself out there because if opportunities will come your way if you're bold and, and, and you put yourself out there. Fantastic bit of advice. Louise Goodman, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, for those listening to the show, if you'd like to appear on our next series, drop me uh, an email. All our details are in the show notes. Uh, at the same time, make sure you leave us some reviews on the iTunes category so that we can uh, be found and Louise's interview can be listened to uh, globally by more and more people. Louise, first female of motorsport or f1 <laughs> indeed um thank you so much for ag agreeing to be on the show for a second time um obviously good luck with the rest of covid as for everybody else listening to this and uh, look forward to speaking to you and seeing you again in the future my great pleasure thank you for having me and just to reiterate your comments good luck everybody getting through all of this take care thank you The Inside Silverstone podcast is produced by the team at Longhurst for the benefit of those with a passion for all things tech, engineering and innovation. For more information, please visit longhurst.co.uk forward slash Inside Silverstone, whilst also remembering to give us a 5 out of 5 star rating on iTunes. Please note that neither Chris Broom or Longhurst work for Silverstone Park, Silverstone Circuit or Silverstone Technology Cluster. <laughs>